Hey, good morning. I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here. Man, we're really glad that you are worshiping with us today, especially if you're new. Just a big welcome. We're starting a new series today. We're kind of looking at kind of some relatively minor characters in the Bible, maybe some stories and some people that get a little bit overlooked. And um, in our in our family, we're kind of we kind of big. We kind of have a minor character deal. We just kind of like minor characters. You know, everybody's always. You know, rooting for the hero, and it's usually the comic relief or something like that in a movie that's our favorite. And it's true, like in Disney movies too. Like, like, like my all time, one of my all time favorite characters is Gus Gus the Mouse in Cinderella. You may not even know what that is. He's amazing. I love him. And um, so, so here's a little pro tip for you. Uh, our family will go to Disney World about every three or four years. We really, we really like it. And um, one of the things that people always want to do at Disney World when the parades go by is to try to get the characters' attention. Right, but here's the problem. The problem is everybody's going after Mickey Mouse, right? Mickey Mouse goes, Mickey, Mickey, Mickey. Mickey can't say hi to everybody. Cinderella cannot say hi to everybody. So if you want personal attention from a character at Disney World, then you go after the minor characters. So let me just give you an example. This is not fake. This is real. Um, This last time we were there, the Peter Pan float goes by. And I'm standing there right there on the side... Mr. Smee! Smee! Hey, Smee! And I have no idea the person inside the Smee character, what their thing is. Like, what on earth? They're like, hey! Like, we're waving. It was great. It was great. And then the Cinderella float goes by, and Cinderella, like, Drizella! Drizella over here! Drizella! Which, this is not someone in a full costume. This is someone with makeup. So you, you can actually see this girl's face. Earth. I mean, it's like, I can't imagine very many days Drizella gets shouted. So we do this several times, and then near the end of the parade, this, this really tall German lady who's standing next to me, she leans over, she goes, I'm very glad to have been standing next to you during the parade today. <laughs> yeah, you are. Tell your friends, tell the whole country of Germany. That's a pro tip for you. What were we talking about? Oh, yeah, minor characters. That was it. That was the whole point of that story, minor characters. Minor characters. So, yeah, there's some great stories in here. Kind of some ordinary people, some just kind of some, some, some stories that you don't necessarily notice or doesn't get a lot of attention drawn to that are really incredible. So uh, a couple of these are going to be in the book of Judges, including today. We're going to be in Judges chapter 4, talking about uh, a woman named Deborah. And so to make sure we understand the book of Judges, there's a couple things we need to know. First, there's kind of this cycle that goes through Judges where... Everything's good, everything's going great, and so when everything's going fine, the people begin to forget about God and turn to sin, and then corruption begins to take over, and God gets really frustrated with them and brings judgment on them. Judgment is, is in the form of some uh, country or invaders begins to oppress or harass them in some way, and so now the country is kind of in turmoil, and then they realize, oh yes, we've turned away from God, and so they pray uh, to God for deliverance, And God will raise up someone, some sort of military hero of some kind, to come in and free them. And then they have the prosperity again, and then the cycle begins again. Prosperity leads to complacency, turning away from God, falling towards sin. And then, you know, the cycle just continues all throughout the book of Judges. And so, this is kind of, that's kind of the theme of this book. And so, it talks about how God raises up a judge. And you hear the word judge, and you think of someone who kind of has a court and is kind of making decisions. But almost every time in the book of Judges, when you hear judge, probably the best thing is one who brings justice, which is a little bit different. So in this context, a judge could be an executioner. An executioner, you don't think of an executioner as a judge, but if I said, you know, as someone who's bringing the justice... That's what an executioner does. And so these judges, the people who are bringing justice to the evil people oppressing um, Israel, they're bringing the justice. They're the judge over Israel. And so typically a military redeemer of some kind. And so I say almost every time, because Deborah, who we're going to be looking at today, really is the exception to that. And this is all going to come together as we kind of look at the whole story um, she really does function, and we'll see this here in a little bit. She really does function really as what you would consider a judge. It talks about her um, sitting under a tree as people are coming to her asking for wisdom 
and decisions on different kinds of things. And so she kind of acts like a judge. And so we're going to see God use her in a really cool way. And we're going to talk a little bit about, well, how, how can we do that? How can we be used by God in the same way that Deborah is? So we're going to be in Judges chapter 4. We're going to look at quite a few verses here to kind of get the whole uh, story. So we're going to look at the passage rather than me just simply tell the, tell the story. So uh, Judges chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harasheth Haggim. Okay, so here we are, the beginning of that cycle. They, they'd obviously had a guy named Ehud, a guy we're going to actually look at in a couple weeks. Um, he was dead, the Israel started doing evil again, and now they're being um, oppressed. Okay, talking about Sisera, the commander, because he had 900 chariots uh, fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now, Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kedesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands to you, Go take from you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, this is the Lord talking, I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. So Barak said to Deborah, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with, go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kedesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and, and 10,000 men went up under his command. Deborah also went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kedesh. When they told Sisera that Barak son of Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned from Harasheth Haggim to the Kishon River all his men and his 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Haggim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Okay, so I don't know how much of that, I and mean, it's kind of a, a, a long story, how much of that you caught. Sometimes we get a little bit lost in really weird, hard to pronounce names. Um, have I ever given you my pro tip? Pro tip, that's another pro tip. Well, I told you how to do the, um, the parades at Disney World. Another pro tip. If you ever find yourself in the um, awkward situation of having to read the Bible out loud, like in a small group or something, and there's names like that, here's what you do. You just pick your pronunciation and just say it with confidence. Harasheth Haggium. Now, there's like a 4% chance that the actual pronunciation of that is Harasheth Haggium, but you don't know, and I said it with confidence, and you're going, man, he really knows how to pronounce it. So, um, so here's this, this woman, Deborah, and it, it describes her here. It says you know, she was a leader of Israel at the time. That word, that word that's translated leader there is the one that most translations and other places in the books translated judge. So she's kind of taking that, that role as a, as a judge, as a, as a leader in Israel. And people are coming to her saying, hey, we need to have our d- d- disputes settled. And she gets a special message from God. She's a prophet. And what a prophet means in the Old Testament is someone who God gives, I'm going to give you a specific message to give to someone else. So, so this is what he does. So she, so she calls Barak. God gives her this message for this dude Barak. to bring Barak to me. And he, and he comes to her and she says, hey, listen, God's got this plan. He's going to deliver us. People have asked for repentance to be delivered from this oppressor. And God wants to lead you um, to do this. And so God's going to orchestrate the circumstance. You get these 10,000 guys and you go over here. And then God's going to make sure this guy comes over here. And when that happens, you're going to know that God's in it. And you're going to rush him and you take him and you're going to be good. And obviously Barack's a little bit scared. And he says, I'll 
I'll do it, but only if you come with me. Now, this is a part in which I wish that we could, we could, we, we, we could see faces and hear tone of voice because when she says, she says, this, well, that's fine, what you're doing, I'll go with you. But, what, but now the, the victory is going to come through the hands of a woman. And he's just like, is she, is, she, is she busting on him here? He's like, man, all right, I'll go with you for sure. But now people are going to say it was a woman. I mean, like, what, what is she saying here? I kinda, but, 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 the, but the idea is, for sure, and here you are, this military commander, and rather than being the one who goes down as the military commander who won the victory, it's going to be like, it's, it's going to be a woman that, that, that gets the glory here. But regardless, he's like, no, I, I want to, I, I, I need you to come. And you're like, okay. So she goes with, and then it plays out exactly uh, like she said that it would. And they have this great victory, and the commander, he flees on foot. And that's, only, that's all that we read. And I feel like I'd be doing you a disservice. I didn't tell you what happened next. It's really not, Deborah's out of the story now. But this, I feel like I should tell you this one because it's, it's a gross, awful story. And you'll be disappointed in me if you read it later and be like, you dude, he didn't even talk about it. So this guy flees to this village and, and comes to this woman and says, I need you to hide me. So she, she lets him in, this commander of the army. And he, say, he says, if anybody comes, says anybody's here, you tell them nobody's here. She says, okay, fine. So he lays down. He's really exhausted. She hands him some milk. He falls asleep. She goes and gets a tent spike. And while he's laying down like this, she puts it right in the temple of his head, drives it all the way through his head into the ground. The end. Right? There's your story. <laughs> And so they come looking for him. They're like, uh, where? She's like, I-, I got the guy you're looking for. He's right here. Can you imagine? She's like, the guy you're looking for, he's in this tent. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you for that, ma'am. Um, and so God brings this great victory. God brings this great victory to all of Israel um, through Deborah and Barak. And Deborah is, is this in, incredible leader. Who, who speaks uh, passionately for God. He gives this incredible message, and she's this awesome person. And so the thing that I think, I just want to make sure that we all get away from this, first and foremost. The people are in, in desperate need. They, they are in need of deliverance. They, they have turned away from God, and now they are being oppressed, and, and they need help, so they cry out to God, and God answers them. But here's the way that God answers them, and what I want to suggest is this is the way that God almost always, 99.9% of the time, this is the way that God answers prayers like this. God answers prayers with people. God answers prayer with people. So these, they, they needed help. They needed to be free from this oppression. And God chose to answer that prayer specifically through a person. And in this case, really two people, ultimately you know, 10,000 arm, people army too. But he, 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 he raises up a person to meet the need. And that's a pattern all throughout the book of Judges. The people cry out for help from God, and God picks someone. It's like, hey, I want you. You're going to be the one through whom I answer this prayer. Sometimes it's Ehud. We're going to look at a couple weeks, a guy named Gideon, a guy named Samson. So all of these different people, God answers these prayers through a person. Now, there's any number of ways that God could have answered this prayer. He could have just had another kingdom attack that kingdom where they get distracted. He could have, you know, he could have wiped them out, these people with a meteor. I mean, there's any number of supernatural things that God could have done to provide the answer to the question, uh, to, to the prayer. But what God did was he raised up people. And so the answer to these people's prayer were in people. And so what I want you to hear, so there's, there's a couple of things. We could, you could do this sermon a couple of different ways where I'm asking you to imagine that you're the Israelites. And what I would be saying here is, I mean, God, you're, you're, you're praying out to God. God is going to answer your prayer. He's going to bring someone into your life. But for, for today, we're not going to be the Israelites. Today, we're going to be Deborah. And if we're going to be Deborah, what I want you to, to, to walk away with is that you could be the answer to someone else's prayer. That somewhere in your life, maybe somewhere in this room, somewhere where you work, somewhere where you live, uh, your neighborhood, where you go to school, there is somebody that's praying. And they're asking God for help. They're asking if, God, will you just show that you're real? Will you help me financially? I feel lonely. I feel hopeless. I, 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 I need some help. 
There are people around you who are praying prayers like that, and what God wants to do is He wants to use you to be an answer to that prayer. God is wanting to use you to change someone else's life. He wants you to be the vehicle of hope and life to someone right now who in some way is desperate. It's desperate and in need of God. And there's a couple of different reactions that you can have to that. You can be like, well, there's no way, not me. God, God may do that, but not, not through me, through, through, through someone else maybe. Maybe through pastors and preachers and prophets like, um, like, like Deborah. But not me. I'm telling you, the, the, the Bible is full of stories of just ordinary people. Ordinary people who just God uses to be who someone else needed. And that's who you are. And Deborah, while she does have an incredible spiritual gift, being able to be a prophet, she clearly had a lot of wisdom. At the same time, she's just an ordinary person. You know, she's describing, oh, it's Deborah, and this is her husband's name. And she was just a person, just like any of us. And I'm telling you, we are surrounded by need. We're surrounded by people praying cries of desperation. And you have the ability to be able to be used by God to be the answer to someone else's prayer. So what was it about Deborah? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that you could pick from this, and we have a limited amount of time. I'm just going to really kind of look at, I think, at two really important things. Two really important things about Deborah that allowed her to be part of the solution, part of the, the answer to this prayer that all of Israel is praying. And the first one is this, is that Deborah listened to God. That may sound kind of ordinary, but it's really not ordinary. It's actually extraordinary that she would live life in such a way where God can speak to her. And so God is speaking to her. There is things that she, there are things that He is wanting her to understand, things that He is wanting her to do, messages that He is wanting her to give to other people. He's got all these things, and, and, and she is hearing what God has to say. Because, I mean, God, hey, that's a pretty detailed message. It wasn't like, hey, go get Barack, bring him over here, I'm going to tell him something. I like, know, go get Barack, and I want you to tell him. I want you to tell him that this commander is going to do this. I need him to get these 10,000 troops from these, two, from these two tribes, and they're going to meet over here, and then this is going to happen. When that happens, they're going to do this. I want you to tell him all of that. And that's just a good listener. It's a lot of details. And she's hearing God with this. And, it, and apparently... Um, not quite on this scale, but this is something that she did a lot. She sat down under the tree. It says the, the, the tree's name was the Deborah tree. And I'm sure that it was, it was named after her. I'm sure it was not her parents named her. Hey, you know that one tree? We should name our daughter after that tree. It was, it was, it was the opposite. The, the, she held court there, and it was such a powerful place that they just made, we'll just name this the Palm of Deborah where people would come to her with, with complicated disputes, and she would be able to give them God's wisdom. That's an incredible trait, to be able to hear and discern God's voice. And there are a lot of voices, a lot of things pulling us in a lot of different directions. We hear a lot of things. There's voices external to us, voices internal to us that are telling us right and wrong and what we should do and what we want to do. Pull, 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 pull. But she can clearly hear the voice of God. And what I would love for you to believe is that God would love to communicate with you. That God would love to talk to you. That there are opportunities that God is putting in your path that He would love for you to take. The, the deal is that God's not a shouter. He's not a yeller. He, he, he doesn't scream. Typically, God whispers. Like, hey, hey, Charlie, you know what would be a really good idea? You know, you know what you could do? You know what I would love for you to do? I'd love for you to take this guy out to lunch. I'd love for you to talk to this person. Hey, I, here's, here's the kind of thing I'd like for you to talk about on Sunday. He, he whispers those things. He's not going to yell. And so the question for us is, is our, vo- is, is, is our life ever soft enough, quiet enough, to hear a whisper from God? And so ultimately, really, the answer to that for a lot of us is no. And then the response to that is, man, probably our life just needs to slow down. 
we, we need to slow down and, and turn the volume down of our life, turn it down just a little bit, where God can clearly speak to us because we're allowing, we're, we're silencing all the other voices and giving God his opportunity to whisper. And if there's another way, another piece of advice I would, I would give to help you um, be able to listen to God, not only should you just slow down your life a little bit, but you probably just need to be good. I know that's just kind of real basic church 101, two-year-old Sunday school kind of deal, but just like be good. When you're neck deep in sin, I mean, it's just kind of hard for God to be like, hey, because you're not really wanting to listen to him anyway, right? Which is why, and this is a stereotypical overused example, which is fine, I get to do what I want. Um, with the people, with the time where you are least likely to, um, to, to hear God's voice and to do the right thing, is, is when you're driving in your car and someone drives in a way that you don't like, right? Um, you're probably going too fast in your heart, if not on the speedometer, and, and, and you're angry and you're not doing good, and instead of hearing what God wants you to do in that situation, you are yelling down curses on someone that you would never say to them if your windows were down and you were face-to-face with them, right? You are just saying that, talking about them in the worst and most awful ways possible. And... It, and, it, and, it, and because our heart and life, it's like, I've, I've, I've got to get there. I've got to get there. I've got to get there. You know, and it, good grief. And then our heart gets to a place where if God, what if during that 10-minute commute, 30-minute commute, 40-minute commute or whatever, what if God's like, man, I've got really something special I'd love for them to do at work today. Something on their way to visit family. There's something I would love for them to do. I'm just going to tell them. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to wait, though. I'm going to wait till they can hear. I'm going to wait till they calm down. I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to wait. I'm going I'm to keep waiting. They're eventually going to calm down. They're, yeah, they're, when they slow down, when they, no, mm, 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 and doesn't happen. Again, God's not going to yell. But if we could just be good, <laughs> slow it down, calm it down, then the voice of God, I think, could could be a little louder in our life. So Deborah listened to God. She heard this message, and she was passing these messages on to people. But the other piece of that that I think is really important for us to take away is that she wasn't interested in the glory. She wasn't trying to, she wasn't trying to become Deborah from the Bible. God gave her this message about something awesome somebody else was going to do. She wasn't going to deliver the people. She wasn't going to lead an army. She wasn't going to get to go. She, God picked her not to do the awesome thing, but to tell the dude who's going to do the awesome thing. She could have twisted the message a little bit. Hey, God brought, here's what God told us we're going to do. We're going to raise up an army and we're going to go down there. Deborah and Barak, maybe Barak and Deborah, but Deborah and Barak are going to go down and say, no, this is what God has called you to do. There's no glory in the messenger. There's not one moment. This is, and the rest of the book of Judges, you know, if, probably other times that a messenger came to God and said, God has chosen you for this assignment. We don't know who they are. We don't know. They're, they're nobodies in, in the grand history of the Bible. And she seems fine with that. She seems totally fine. Hey, Barak, you are about to be a hero. Not me. I'm going to still be at my tree doing this thing that I do with these people, which is fine. Pretty well known or within walking distance of, 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 of my tree. But you're about to be the hero of the nation if you'll follow God. And she seems fine. And so Barak says, no, 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 I need you to come with me. He's like, that, I'll, sure, I'll come. Obviously, it was not her goal. That was not what she was trying to do. She did not need the glory. She did not need to be the subject of Judges chapter 4. But in her humility, here's the thing that we need to make sure we understand. In her humility, God gave her the glory anyway. We do know who she is. Her story is known. She is celebrated. 
Not because she pursued it, not because she wanted it, but because God wanted to give it to her. He wanted this awesome woman, this incredible example, and not just a great example for women. She is one of the best examples of of women and is is a hero in a lot of women's Bible studies and these kinds of things, but she's not a women's Bible study hero. She's just a regular old hero of incredible character and, and, and hearing from God. Because really all she's interested in, she's not interested in becoming Deborah and having a tree named after her. She wants to listen from God and she wants to help people. That's it. That's her life. I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to help people. And God, in the right opportunity, in the right moment, man, he, he, he gave her the glory. But man, we want the glory, don't we? I mean, do you want to do, I mean, I want to, I want to be someone who does a lot of good things and no one ever knows about it. I mean, you do a good thing, you want to know, right? You want people to know. Uh, this is kind of an ongoing joke. If you're new, this will be your first opportunity into an ongoing joke about me and folding laundry, where um, um, one time I was folding laundry while watching Netflix, this is like eight, eight, nine years ago. I'm folding laundry while I'm watching TV, my wife walks by and she goes, what, are you trying to romance me or something? And I'm like, yeah. Right, and so began this connection between one of the things. It, it feels like I'm romantically pursuing her to fold laundry, which is hilarious. But I'll I fold a lot of laundry, um, and so it's kind of this 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 ongoing joke. But you know, sometimes you're watching TV by yourself, and there's baskets of um, unfolded laundry. You're gonna you're gonna fold the laundry if your wife's not in the room. Oh, not you, me. It's the only person this is even real for. Right, you, me. Am I going to? And so sometimes, you know, if Heidi's in the house and I start folding laundry, like, somebody's folding laundry in here. Just thought you should know the laundry being folded in here. I don't want to miss it. It's serving her, right? Um, or if she's not there, if she's not there at all, sometimes the brother's just got to take a picture of the basket of folded laundry and send it to her, right? Technology's amazing. I, I don't want to do a good thing and not get credit for it. Deborah didn't seem to care. And because of that attitude, she is well known and loved and admired for thousands and thousands of years. And so here we are. You have an opportunity. You have the opportunity to be the answer to someone else's prayer. And I hope, I really do, I hope that when I say that, it it sounds as big as what I mean for it when I say it. Because what I'm saying is this, that there are people begging the God of the universe for help, for love, for insight, for connection, for for, uh, just a moment to know that God is real. They're begging the God of the universe for that. And God looks and says, I want you to do this for me. I want you, you, you do this. God's picking you. That's huge. The question is, does God have the opportunity to tell you? Have you carved out the emotional and mental and spiritual space in your life for God to hear? For for you to be able to hear from God? And, um, or are we too busy? And then really, honestly, we're just too busy pursuing our own glory that I'm not really looking for opportunities to serve. But what if I could be humble? And I'm just going to have an attitude like Deborah. Man, I just want to hear from God and I want to help you. That's it. That's my life. I want to hear from God. I want to help you. That's it. That's my life. That's who God has called me to be. And if that's who God has called me to be and I come in with that attitude, you can expect God do amazing things in and through your life just like you did with Deborah and the glory may not come in that moment but there will come a time when the glory and the power of that moment will be known maybe an eternal thing there will come a time where God will raise up the people who had the courage and the heart to listen and serve and he will overwhelm and shower you Let's be that kind of people. So we've got this opportunity to respond. We're going to worship here for a few more minutes. 
opportunity to give. We've got the prayer candles. The prayer teams back there would love to pray with you. You can take communion back there. You can pray at the cross. There's lots of different ways to respond. But maybe it just means, man, I just need to slow down my life a little bit. God, help me do that. Or maybe you got to get the courage to say yes to the thing that we already know that God's been kind of whispering to you already. But whether you've got to get your heart right or you've got to take the bold step, let's ask God to help each one of us, maybe even today, to be the answers to people's prayers all over, all over our city. Let's pray.